corrosion initiation time decreases as the sorptivity index increases. So sorptivity index increasing means your concrete is weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay. So weaker concrete will have a faster corrosion initiation time. Remember this is weeks. So it's an accelerator test. So when you play it out in the real structure, it'll look years rather than weeks. If the sorptivity index is low, the pores are less connected. Therefore, the corrosion initiation time will be, let's say, 12 weeks as compared to 8 weeks. Okay. If you have a different cover, the relationship is much more different. Needless to say, from that graph, I can say I should use 40 mil cover for a concrete very directly. Okay. That means I'm going to get a completely different relationship, and that's given. If you're looking at corrosive environment, cover is one of your protective systems. Next is your diffusivity or your connectivity. Okay. If you look at the ICE construction manual, you see a classification like this for different tests. ICE construction manual was put together by a few people, including myself and Bashir and Sudarshan who looked at all the tests. So our idea was to say, if you buy anything that's commercially available, what classification system works? Some of the other tests have classification in between as well. They're quite more defined because they might be newer tests. So for Autoclam, if you're looking at a value, let's say you got sorptivity index is 1.3 or less than 1.3, then you can say the predicted risk is low. That it's a good quality concrete. Extremely high means the sorptivity index is high, which means it's a bad, not bad, it's a weaker quality concrete. <clears throat> the value difference between these points matters. That shows the sensitivity of a test. Okay. Some tests are very, very sensitive, 0.1 to 0.9, but it's a different scale, obviously. And that's something you need to watch out for. If you are comparing very similar concretes, comparison might not be possible. So don't put your effort until you're familiar that the test gives you a very good spectrum. <coughs> Sorry. There is a there's something called OPI, Oxygen Permeability Index. It's a South African test, and that is also very comparable, and is a bit more easier test to perform. But it requires a core, unfortunately. The advantage of OPI test is that it's connected to South African standards. So if you get a value, then the standards will tell you this is your expected service life. So if you're using that as a means for justifying a concrete, I suggest using that. Oxygen permeability index. So, um, what time is it? 12.14, something. Yeah. Okay. Okay, very quickly into permits and then we can do the rest. So, permit is very close to my heart. <clears throat> in, the, in the diffusion environment where you have salt on one side and you don't have salt on the other side, all that you're trying to create is exactly that. So this is a very typical standardized test that you have where you have sodium chloride on one side, sea salt, concrete here, and no salt on the other side. It's a very simple system. And there's 20 tests of that generic nature. Everything will have a different solution here and a different solution here. And annoyingly, all of them will create different diffusivity, but in a range, in a comparable range. So I'm not particular that you use any any test as long as you use an exposure environment that is translatable to your site. So if you look for marine structures, look for a seawater solution there. And some people prefer to use a calcium solution here so that the calcium leaching is balanced. Whatever test you do, be consistent. Okay, 
what it does is the chlorides because there is a difference in concentration will go from this side to that side. In years, it takes years for it to go. At the start of my PhD, I put this test into, into a large container, there's about 25 different cells, very similar to this. And we were hoping that in the next two years we get data so we can establish pure test results. That was 2005. It still hasn't came to the other side. <laughs> so it's not feasible, basically. <clears throat> but that, that's the test. That's the reality. You have salt here. You have no salt there. It takes time. We really don't have time, so we need to make things happen faster. How do you make it? How do you make things go faster? You force it. You have to find a force. You have to find a driving force. People use higher concentration of salt as a driving force. A version of this test will use 0.3 molar salt solution, which is probably the lowest end of things. Typical seawater is 0.55 molar. So means about 19 grams per liter of salt. One of the versions used 0.3, which is very low. The other version used 2.8 molar, which is extremely high. Okay, Anything above the saturation point will be reached, so it won't really go. So that is one method of acceleration. You have a super concentration on one side. <clears throat> the other methods of acceleration are... Temperature. The flow is a temperature dependent function. You increase the temperature, you charge the particle high enough, they'll go. 40 degrees might do. Anything above 40 is a bit unrealistic to compare. So there are tests which will use 0.55 mole at 40 degree. Okay. It was just about to become the European standard, but it fell off. In the end, the European standard decided to adopt a different test. It was nearly considered to be European standard, a 40 degree acceleration. What other acceleration is possible? <clears throat> a battery technology works here. You can accelerate by putting a voltage difference, okay? You're looking for chlorides, which is a negative ion, to go to the other side. So we just put a negative ion charge point here and put a positive ion charge point there. Then there's a flow, okay? Higher the potential difference, faster the flow. If you crack the potential difference higher than 60 volt, for example, very fast will be the flow, but along with that, the heat will be significant. It will start to overheat the system because you're charging the particles too fast. So most of the tests available in the market limits everything to 60 volt. There are two reasons for it. One is that whatever you do, you should be able to get a diffusion coefficient in the end. That's fundamental. If you overheat it, then temperature also plays a part, so you'll have to compensate for temperature. It's too much to handle because you don't know what's, whether the flow is due to migration or flow is due to temperature. So it's confusing. So they limit it to 60. Second and the main reason is anybody who got electrocuted by a DC circuit would know anything above 60 is painful. Okay, And these are open channel voltage systems. And a lot of things can go wrong, so to limit the casualty from it, we put a limit of 60 volt. It won't be casualty, but it'll be very sore, painful days after. So 60 is the maximum. At 60, you will feel it if the current reaches anything above 100 milliampere. You will feel it. If it's closer to 500, you will really feel it and fry almost. <clears throat> so we put a lot of limits on these things because people handling this stuff. Okay, happy enough? Those are the known acceleration to me. There's one more accelerator that I can mention. Some of you might have a capability of doing it. It's called um,
changing the gravity. Gravity. How can I change the gravity? There's a technique called centrifuge. So a lot of soil studies have been conducted in centrifuge. Centrifuge can come really massive these days. So it's just spin quite strongly and then create a g-force of certain height, certain value, and then the flow will be faster. We believe. I haven't tested it, but it's in the pipeline. There's only a few universities that have centrifuge. <clears throat> so this is what one of the forerunners of the test, which is in the scheme like that, will look like. You have a cylinder on one side, you have a cylinder on the other side, you have some form of holding mechanism with the concrete in the middle. So the flow will happen from A to B. Do the job. Ultimately, we should be able to get a, a coefficient from that flow because if you don't get a coefficient, same as here, a coefficient means it has a unit to it. If you don't have the unit, then you can't use it in service life other than to say certain values will give you certain service life. It's very empirical. So most of the tests in this category will give you a diffusion coefficient. They do that by using one or other transport equations. If you apply a voltage, you can only use Nernst Einstein equation or Nernst Planck equation. And they define the voltage quite nicely, so you can use those two equations. And this is why I was saying that to avoid the effect of temperature, because that means that will be another equation to solve at the same time. Okay. You can also measure a diffusivity by testing concrete taken from the site or concrete cast in the lab which mimics that of the site. So this is a this is a concrete with a dike in the top where we put the salt solution and we let the salt go through the concrete slowly. Okay. You can accelerate that kind of arrangement by drying it and wetting it again. So we normally put one day of salt Next day, 24 hours later, we wipe it clean, we let it dry, air dry in the atmosphere for six days, and we go back and do one day cycling. So that cycles, basically. That kind of cycle means it will be a bit of capillary absorption plus diffusion. So this layer will be capillary absorption dominant, further layers will be diffusion dominant. <clears throat> and you can get things to go really fast if you want. But if it's pure diffusion, if you let the water sit there for long enough, you can use one of the fixed law, which is originally derived for medicine absorption into the tissues. You can use that to calculate the diffusion coefficient. It's quite easy. And we will use that to solve one of the um, problems tomorrow and day after tomorrow. <clears throat> so the concentration difference at any time, or the concentration at any time or depth can be defined by that equation. So if we use that equation and if you plot that into the graph that we get, from the graph we can get a diffusion coefficient out. Okay, And that's on the assumption you know the surface concentration. So it's much easier for lab stuff because you know what you put in. Quite tricky for the site. Okay. You can apply the same equation if you drill. If you drill and take concrete samples from the structure, you can use the same equation to get uh, a diffusivity, but it's very much of an apparent diffusivity because you don't know what the surface concentration is and how changing or flex how fluctuating that is. Okay. This is one of the methods whereby you can drill. There's n number of methods, but this is quite a site-worthy method. I think it's sold by um, German Instruments, but I'm sure different versions of it exist. It has a diamond-tipped edge, so it can drill in a particular fashion up to a particular depth that you tell it to do. So we collect it, and then these data points are plotted. So we collect the dust, we do chloride analysis, which is a wet chemistry analysis, 
<clears throat> it'll tell you the chloride concentration in that powder. Remember, if you're dealing with concrete, the powder will include stone, sand, and cement paste, dry cement paste. So variability is inherent because if you're drilling into a stone, you're probably going to get that value to be zero. So what we do is we largen the area, so 75 mil is typical. So typically aggregates are 25 mil or less. <clears throat> so which means in 75 mil, I'm sure I'll catch a lot of cement. Okay. And we drill maybe two, three millimeters at a time. And then we clean it and we drill again. We collect all the dust, analyze it and plot it as depth from the surface against the chloride concentration. And this is a very telltale graph. There'll be more chloride concentration on the surface. There'll be very little chloride concentration on the depth. What's critical for us is where the steel is located. Okay. If, let's say, the critical threshold concentration for corrosion is one, let's say, that means this structure will corrode if the cover is less than 52, 53 mil at the time of measurement. Okay. If you use mathematics, you can then move the line up and down, and that's what the three lines indicate. They're mathematical predictions, basically, of this data points. So let's say this is 10 years later. Yeah, seven years after. This is the real data point from a North Sea structure, Portland cement structure. North Sea is a very calm sea. Okay. It has the same amount of concentration as any other seas here, 0.55 mole. Seven years later, it's one of the best concretes. So seven years later, there's chlorides up to 52 mil. Just seven years later. That's an exceptionally made concrete, by the way. Thankfully, they put the reinforcement at 60 plus for the structure. There was a structure nearby as well. Okay, so it's only after seven years. So I can, if I can mathematically predict it, which you will going to do soon, you can extend the graph to see how it'll behave 10 years, 50 years, 100 years later. Okay, fundamental for this prediction is that you have a diffusivity estimated using the equation. You can put in a surface concentration this is trickier than what it sounds. And then you know how the material, the reaction part of it behaves. Okay, so these are the assumptions that you start with. Most mathematical models nowadays will take all of these assumptions in and they will give you a prediction back. Okay, <clears throat> so That's where we're going with. While I'm there, I need to remind you, um, would you have access to laptops? Would you have, sorry, for tomorrow, um, would you be able to bring laptop or any devices that has Excel function in it? If you can, sh you can share obviously, if three people can have one computing system, that would be great. Because tomorrow onwards I'm going to move from mechanism to mathematical part of it, especially for chlorides and for carbonation. So I'd like to see if you can put that equation in and you can predict it so you can get a gauge of things. Okay. So if you bring a laptop which has Excel file, great. You can share between. <clears throat> so going back, the diffusivity measured by different tests gives you different kind of diffusivity. We have agreed now that we call them differently. That's, that's all we have achieved in the last 20 years. And everything have a different name and different reason. So DE means effective. This is the test that I said I started at the beginning of PhD, hasn't completed yet. So it's a very slow test. It is recognized as the best comparable test, but very unrealistic test. So therefore, it's going to go into the bin. The next one is chloride profile. It's a very site-worthy test. It's much more easy to do. Or there's another version of the um, diffusion test which relies on non-steady. So things like this. Okay, it's a non-steady flow. 
whereas the test that I said here, if you don't have voltage, it'll be a steady flow. Things will be non-steady at the beginning, but then it'll have a steady flow. Okay? Non-steady will happen faster, steady follows the non-steady. So this is why that test can give you both steady state as well as non-steady state test. Okay? So preferred method is that. Here, faster to perform, more sight realistic. And then if you're comparing things in the lab or on the site, you can use a faster migration test. Because these two things are expensive, they are expensive no matter how you look at it. Conductivity tests are very, very popular. Conductivity tests includes the electrical resistivity pins that you put on the surface called Venner corrosion probes or something like carbon andrade system, you take a core, you put two plates between them and you put a charge and you see what the resistivity is. Those tests are becoming very, very popular. <clears throat> Some of them can give you diffusivity, most of them cannot, they can only give you resistivity. <clears throat> but you can then relate it to diffusivity. Okay? So there's a South African conductivity test which gives you the diffusivity and uses a fundamental equation and boundary conditions to do so. The very common test is American charge-based test. It's called rapid chloride migration test, RCPT or RCMT. It does not give you migration coefficient, but people have extended it and they got migration coefficient from it. I'm not a fan of it. I'm happy if they do migration coefficient from it, because then mathematically we can expand. <clears throat> RCPT, in my opinion, should Okay, you can use it for comparing A and B and C if they are comparable. Otherwise, it shouldn't be used. Because you use a lot of additives in your system, chemical additives. It's quite often we now use fibers in the system. And if your cement systems are differently conductive, it will give you different results. It will be confusing results, wrongly confusing results. Okay? So that's it. We will... Um, Restart from the lab to the site one tomorrow. If you can bring in a computer with an Excel file, that would be great. Um, we'll just open up an Excel file and we'll start programming things. Not programming, so putting the Excel file in, see if we can create a model. Okay. <clears throat> so as far as I'm concerned, if you get the idea of making your own tests for the required performance, great. And don't shy away from it because you are as close to any other standardized test. Tests will become standardized after 25 years of people pressurizing and putting, sitting in a lot of committees and trying to get changes. Autoglam, I think, is just now moving into a standard because it's 20 years past. British standards are exceptionally slow, exceptionally slow. American standards are fast, and that's why ASTM despite being not so reliable thing, it's very popular test. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, if you take, if you develop a test, in-house test for your own laboratory, and you're happy with the behavior from the test, that's fine. Because you are increasing your confidence. Anybody working in site will know the ultimate game is to be confident. If you are confident, it's fine. Okay, then we will chat tomorrow further. Have a good day. For okay, okay. Not that I know of. However, half cell is very much concrete resistivity function. So if you're meshing directly on the steel, you should have got minus 1,400 millivolt. If the same steel at the same corrosion